In section 6, we're going to learn some theorems that will help us to solve polynomial equations, first of which is we're finally getting to the fundamental theorem of algebra by Carl Gauss, which says every polynomial where the degree is larger than 1, even if it has complex coefficients, you can find at least one linear factor. Now, if we expand upon that with another theorem by Carl Gauss, every polynomial where the degree is larger than 1, even if it has complex roots, we can find exactly n linear factors. So the uh, same number of factors as the degree of the polynomial. x to the fifth, five factors. To expand on that, once you found that factors, we can use the zero product property to turn those factors into finding roots. So essentially what we said earlier was that if we have x to the second, we're looking for two roots. We also know there are two linear factors. x to the third is our largest exponent polynomial of degree 3, we're looking for three roots, three linear factors. And we've addressed this also previously, but now finally declaring it. Conjugate root theorem for complex numbers in that polynomial where the degree is greater than or equal to 1, even if it has real coefficients. If you find a complex number as a root, then its conjugate is also the root. So complex roots occur in conjugate pairs. And we've said this previously as well. If you have the conjugate root theorem for irrational numbers, you've got that polynomial p of x where the degree is greater than or equal to 1, and you have real number coefficients. If you find an irrational root, a plus b times the square root of c, then you should also have its conjugate, a minus b, the square root of c, as a root. In other words, irrational roots occur in conjugate pairs as well. Now we're going to take all of those theorems and put them together to try to find some solutions to polynomials. But to do that, we're going to work backwards as we did in a previous section. So we know that 2 and 3 minus i are roots. From one of our theorems we just mentioned, complex roots occur in conjugate pairs according to the conjugate root theorem for complex numbers. So 3 minus i is a root. 3 plus i must be the root. And we have 1, 2, 3 answers now, which is good because we're looking for a cubic equation, meaning degree 3. So to list them, x equals 2, x equals 3 minus 1, x equals, sorry, x equals 3 minus i, x equals 3 plus i. Those are my three roots. We're going to use the zero product property backwards. So x minus 2 is a factor. If we bring 3 minus i over with the x by subtracting the 3 and adding the i, x minus 3 plus i is my second factor. And if we bring the 3 plus i over with the x by subtracting the 3 and subtracting the i, x minus 3 minus i is my third factor. Now if we look at the factors in brackets here, parentheses plus i, parentheses minus i, they're really conjugates. So when we multiply, we multiply the first, we multiply the last. Instead of foiling, the outside and insides will drop out. So let's take this x minus 3 and square it. So remember, when you square a binomial, you get a trinomial. x squared, multiply those two and double it, minus 6x. Take the last term and square it. All right, also don't forget that i squared is the same as negative 1. So subtracting a negative 1 is the same as adding 1. And easily enough, 1 plus 9 is 10. All right, now we've got a binomial times a trinomial, like we've seen in Chapter 4. Think of it as double the distributive property. Everything in that trinomial gets multiplied by the first term of the binomial. And everything gets multiplied by the second term. So let's do that as well. In the blue, x times x squared is x cubed. x times negative 6x is negative 6x squared. x times 10 is 10x. And the red, negative 2 times x squared is negative 2x squared. Negative 2 times negative 6x is positive 12x. And negative 2 times 10 is negative 20. Simplify my like terms, we get x cubed. Negative 6x squared minus 2x squared is negative 8x squared. 10x plus 12x is 22x minus 20. So there is my polynomial going from the three roots to the cubic polynomial. So the roots were 2, 3 minus i, 3 plus i. There's the polynomial. 
All right, well, let's start to go forward direction now. We have a polynomial x to the fourth, minus 12x minus 5 is 0. That's degree 4, so we're looking for four roots. They're going to break us in gently and tell us the first root. We can find the second root simply by the conjugate root theorem for complex numbers. So if negative 1 plus 2i is a root, then negative 1 minus 2i, its conjugate, must also be a root. We've got two roots down, two roots to go. How do we find them? Well, let's formalize that x equals negative 1 minus 2i, or x equals negative 1 plus 2i are the two roots. Let's use the zero product property backwards to find those two factors. So x plus 1 plus 2i is one factor. x plus 1 minus 2i is my second factor. If we multiply those together, we'll find a polynomial not 1 to the 4th power, but we'll find a polynomial. Let's look at that polynomial, see what degree it turns out being. So we're going to take the parentheses, since these are essentially conjugates. Multiply the first, multiply the last. Take that binomial and square it as x squared plus 2x plus 1. Remember, i squared is negative 1, and negative 4 times negative 1 is positive 4, which when we added to 1 is 5. So when we multiply our two roots together, backwards using the zero product property, yep, we get a quadratic, or x to the second. How do we find the remaining two roots? Well, synthetic division won't help us out here, but I'm going to take x squared plus 2x plus 5 as my divisor, divide that into my original polynomial, and leaving placeholders, x to the fourth, plus 0x cubed, plus 0x squared, minus the 12x, minus the 5. My quotient will be a, qu a quadratic polynomial. It'll be x squared. And if I solve that using the quadratic formula, I'll find my remaining two roots. But first, long division. So it's important that we learn this. So x squared times x squared is x to the fourth. Let's distribute that out x squared times x squared is x to the fourth. x squared times 2x is 2x to the third. x squared times 5 is 5x squared. And instead of subtracting polynomials, we are going to add the opposites. x to the fourth drop out. No x cubed minus 2x cubed is negative 2x cubed. No x squared plus negative 5x squared is negative 5x squared. And we bring down the next term. What times x squared is negative 2x cubed? Well, negative 2x. Distribute that out will give me negative 2x to the third. Negative 2x times positive 2x is negative 4x squared. And then negative 2x times positive 5 is negative 10x. Again, instead of subtracting polynomials, we'll add the opposites. When we do so, the x cubes drop out to 0. Negative 5x squared plus 4x squared is negative 1x squared. Negative 12x plus 10x is negative 2x, and we bring down the next term. To continue long division, what times x squared is negative x squared? Well, that's negative 1. To distribute that out, negative 1 times x squared is negative x squared. Negative 1 times positive 2x is negative 2x. Negative 1 times positive 5 is negative 5. And instead of subtracting polynomials, we'll add the opposites. x squareds drop out to 0. x to the first drop out to the 0. Constants drop out to 0. And they better. If we did not get 0 as a remainder, we did something wrong somewhere along the way. We started out with two roots, which gave us this polynomial when we did the zero product property backwards long division, we should get a remainder of 0. So my other quotient holds the secret of my other two solutions, x squared minus 2x minus 1. So let's just take that, throw that into the quadratic formula, or complete the square, or factor. It will not factor, so let's use the quadratic formula. a is 1, b is negative 2, c is negative 1. Substitute that into the formula, simplify. Square root of 8 can be simplified as the square root of 4 times the square root of 2, which is 2 square roots of 2. And there's a greatest common factor of 2 in the numerator. 
which when we factor it out leaves me with 1 plus or minus 1 square root of 2. When we divide that 2 factor in the numerator with the factor of 2 in the denominator, we found our other two roots, 1 plus the square root of 2, 1 minus the square root of 2, which reminds us of the complex, uh, sorry, the conjugate root theorem for irrational numbers. If you get one irrational solution, you should have its conjugate. So to summarize, we were given the first roots, negative 1 plus 2i. We used the conjugate root theorem for complex numbers to say we must have its conjugate complex number also, negative 1 minus 2i. We used those two solutions to go backwards to find a quadratic polynomial. Did long division. With our quotient, we put that in the quadratic formula to get my remaining two roots. So my four roots, I have complex irrationals, uh, sorry, conjugate irrationals, and conjugate complex numbers. So those are the four solutions. Now to help us, we're going to throw out a couple more theorems. One is Descartes' rule of signs. It says how many positive real roots you will get from a polynomial p of x that has real coefficients is either the same as the number of sign changes, variations, from addition to subtraction, subtraction to addition, or a multiple of two less than the number of sign changes. There's a corollary that goes with it. If you're looking for negative real roots of a polynomial that has real coefficients, if you replace x with the opposite of x, simplify that polynomial. It's either the same as the number of sign variations from addition to subtraction, subtraction to addition, or a multiple of 2 less than that. So for now, instead of finding out what the roots are, we're going to try to find out what kind of roots are they. Do we have positive real roots? Do we have negative real roots? What about the complex, you ask? Well, hold on. So let's start with example 3. And we're going to start out p of x is x to the fifth plus x to the fourth minus 3x squared plus 4x plus 6. And we have two sign variations from addition to subtraction and subtraction to addition. So Descartes' rule of signs says I have 2, or a multiple of 2 less than that. 2 minus 2 is 0. I have 2 or 0 positive real roots. Now I'm not going to subtract 2 from 0 because you can't have negative 2 answers. So I either have two or I have none of these positive real roots. I don't know yet. Well, let's do the corollary. Corollary says replace x in my original polynomial with the opposite of x. And let's do that in parentheses. And let's simplify. So that's negative x to the fifth. When we have a negative to an even exponent, that's positive x to the fourth. It's going to be positive x squared times the negative 3 is negative 3x squared. And a positive times the negative is a negative. Now let's count my sign variations. Subtraction to addition, addition to subtraction, subtraction to addition. There are three sign changes. So the corollary tells me that there are three negative real roots or a multiple of two less. So subtract 2 from 3 to get 1 one negative real root. Now the only good information I have right now is this one. Because for positive real roots could be two, could be zero. For negative real roots could be three or could be one, but I'm guaranteed one of my answers is a negative number and it's a real number. How do we figure out what the complex numbers are? Well, we take all the possible combinations. I have two or zero positive real roots. I have three or one negative real roots. My polynomial was x to the fifth degree five, so I'm looking for five roots. Let me take all the possibilities of two and three, two and one, zero and three, zero and one, see how many roots are remaining, and that's how many that could be complex numbers. So. 2 positive, if it's the case that there are 2 positive real roots, and there are 3 negative real roots, that's 5 answers. And I was looking for 5 answers, so that means there are none of them that are complex. But it could be the possibility or the combination that I have 2 positive real roots with 1 negative real root. 2 plus 1 is 3 roots. 
I'm looking for five, so two of them could be complex roots. Well, it could be the case that I have zero positive real roots with three negative real roots. Zero plus three is three. That's three of my five roots. So my other two roots could be complex numbers. Or perhaps it's the case that I have zero positive real roots and one negative real root. Zero plus one is one. That's one answer. I need four more. They could be complex numbers. And so what I have here is what I know is I have, so what we have are I could have two or zero positive real roots. I could have three negative real roots or one negative real root. And I could have zero, two, or four complex roots. Why do we want to know these things? Well, sometimes when we look at graphs, we look at those. If my graph crosses the x-axis, that corresponds to a real root. And since I'm guaranteed one negative real root, what I know about graphing this polynomial so far is somewhere to the left of the y-axis, where x is negative, my graph crosses the x-axis once, because I'm guaranteed one negative real root. Now, the others, if they're complex roots, complex roots have some kind of change in direction in my curve. My curve is going toward maximum, dropping toward minimum, and turning around again. That's an indication of a complex root. It's possible that could happen if I have two complex roots or four complex roots. We won't really know further until we spend more time graphing. All right, that's our look of our uh, Swiss Army knife of theorems that will help us solve polynomials.